So, here we are continuing with Dog Song, and we're on the final chapter in Part 2, Chapter 14, and it's entitled, The Dream Run. At the other end of the dream run, nothing was the same as when he started. At the other end, Russell was no longer young, but he wasn't old either. He wasn't afraid, but he wasn't brave. He wasn't smart, but he wasn't a fool. He wasn't as strong as he would be, but he wasn't ever going to be as weak as he was. When he thought of what happened later, when he wasn't what he would be, but wasn't what he had been, he thought that in some mysterious way a great folding had happened. The dream had folded into his life, and his life had folded back into the dream so many times that it was not possible for him to find which was real and which was a dream. Nor did he feel that it was important to decide. In its way, the dream was more real than the run, than his life. These things happened, either in the dream or the run, either in one fold or another fold. These things happened. He came to know the woman girl. She was named Nancy. She had become pregnant without meaning to without being married, and because the missionaries had told her that it was a sin, she had been driven by her mind, driven out into the tundra to die on the snow machine. But fear had taken her. She had been afraid to die, and she had turned to go back. She did not know how far she had come, and she had run out of gas. She had started to walk, had gone down with the cold, was going to die, and Russell saved her. She had gone first out to sea and then turned inland so they would think she'd gone through the ice and would not look for her inland. She did not have parents to worry for her. Her baby was not due for four months, but she had pain in the tent that first night and Russell worried, though there was nothing he could do for her. They could not leave. The storm was too strong for them to leave. He fed her meat and fat from the caribou carcass. Watching her eat and talk between mouthfuls, heating the pieces of meat and putting them in her mouth, holding back when she winced with pain as she came back from freezing, handing her the next piece when she was ready for it. He let her talk and talk now that, she, now that he was rested. When at last she had settled and had stopped talking about herself, she stared at him. What is the matter, Russell asked. Have you never seen people before? Nancy looked down, suddenly shy. It isn't that. It just came to me that you were out here with a dog team. There is nothing out here. How did you come to be here? Russell thought of telling her of Ugruk, of the dream, of the run, but held back. That was part of his song, and it wouldn't be good to talk about it before it was ready to sing. Then he thought he might tell her of the lamp, but decided against that for the same reason. Finally, he shrugged, I am a person who is running north and came upon your machine. That is all. He did not tell her about following the tracks for so long. How far north? It was an impertinent question, but he ignored the discourtesy. Until I run to the end of where I am going. And then she did a strange thing. She nodded almost wisely. I understand, but tell me, is it possible for a person to be with you when you run north to the end? It was a hard question to answer. In this run, Russell thought, in this run I thought I would be alone, but it was perhaps not supposed to be so. It may be that is what the dream is telling me, that I am not supposed to be alone, if the dream is telling me anything. Or another way of thinking, is it possible to leave her out here? No. And still a third way, would it be possible to take her home? There is nothing for me there, she said, shaking her head when he asked. I have done wrong. There is not a way to live there. I will stay out there, here, and die, Russell finished for her. Yes. No, he shook his head. You tried that, and it didn't work. You became afraid and tried to get home. Not home, she corrected. Back. I have no home. So? So? What am I to do? Take me with you. I will earn my way. I can scrape the skins and sew them. I can make camp. I can feed dogs. Do you know dogs? No. There were none in my village. But I can learn. And in that way, she came to be with him when his life folded into the dream and the dream folded into his life. In that way, she came to be with him on the run. Again, during the long storm night, she slept and he dozed, but did not dream. And when he awakened this time, there was light outside the tent, and the wind had stopped. He reached outside and brought his parka in, scraped the ice off, slid it over his underparka, and stood outside. He was stiff, worse than he'd ever been, so he stretched, felt his bones crack and creak. The woman girl put her anorak on and came out. It is cold, she said. Cold is our friend. 
I know, but I am not dressed as you. I feel it more. We will wrap you in skins in the sled. You will be all right. She said nothing, but nodded and began taking the tent down when he packed meat off the carcass for the dogs. She put one skin on the bottom of the sled, curved up on the sides, and the hair in. The other three she put on top as a kind of blanket with the four fur inside. When it came time to go, after he had fed and brought the dogs up, she got in between the hides. There is comfort here, he misunderstood. I have never hauled anybody who is going to have a baby. I meant it is warm. There is nothing comfortable about having a baby. Ah, I see. The dogs were rested but stiff, and it took them a mile or so to loosen up, but they settled into the routine of running. The leader knew that Russell wanted to cover distance, and they ran. The land was new, white new, with snow from the storm and drifts from the wind, and after a time the dogs were running up the sides of a white saucer into the light, running out and out until their legs vanished in light, and the steam came back to rustle across their backs and turned them into part of the wind, turned them into ghost dogs. He stood, he stood the sled loosely, proud of the team, and he could tell that the woman girl thought highly of them. Out, he thought, out before me they go, out before me I go. They go. They ran north, now two, where there was one, ran north for the mother of wind and the father of ice. And these things happened when Russell's life folded into the dream and the dream folded into his life. It came that they ran past their food. <coughs> it was true that he perhaps fed the dogs a bit too much, but they were working hard and it took meat and fat to drive them. Three, four, seven more days of running north stopping at night in the skins with the lamp and the chips of fat and the yellow glow which they ate much and talked little. Sat in their own minds until they dozed and he came to know the woman girl. Eight, nine, ten days and nights. They ran north toward the mother of wind. They ran past their food. The first and second day without food there was no trouble. The dogs grew weak but when they didn't get fed they went back to work and began to use of the stored fat and meat of their bodies. They will run to death, Ugrick had said. You must not let them. At the end of the second day, Russell's stomach demanded food, and when he didn't feed it and ignored it, his body finally quit asking for food, and he went to work and began using the meat and fat of his body. The woman girl grew weak rapidly because her body fed the baby within. Russell saved the last of the food for her, and when that was gone, it was obvious that the dog could not go much further. He stopped. There had been no game, no sign. They had, been seen, they had seen nothing, and he worried. No, more than worried. He had been worried when the first two days with no game sighted had come. Now he was afraid. He had to make meat. I will leave you in the tent and take the team for meat. They will run lighter with only one person. Nancy agreed, nodding. She got slowly out of the sled and pulled the skins out to make the shelter. They were near the side of a cut bank where a creek had long ago run. They used the dirt bank for one wall and made a lean-to. There were some chips for the lamp and a long strip of fat that he had been saving for fuel. Pictures from the dream haunted him, and he did not want to leave her without heat. When the shelter was up, he returned to the sled. I'll be back. It was as close as he would come to a goodbye as he made the dogs leave. They did not want to go. They thought they should sleep in camp and eat and saw no reason to go out again. But he forced them, and when they were away from camp, he made them run to the east, up the old creek bed. If there is game, he thought, it will be up the creek run. But they all went on that day into the dark and he saw nothing. No hair, no ptarmigan, no tracks of anything. With dark, he stopped and lay on the sled in his parka. There was light wind, but not the vicious cold of the previous days of running. He tried to sleep, but it did not come. Instead, he lay awake all night thinking of the woman girl back in the tent. It did not find game. If he did not find game, she would die. She would die. He would die. The dogs would die. Perhaps I ought to run back to her and kill and eat the dogs, he thought, over and over. If he kept running away from the shelter until the dogs went down, he would not get back to her. If there was not game out ahead of him, he would not get back to her. If he saw game, but his mind was not true and the arrow flew wrong, he would not get back. She would die. She would die. He would die. The dogs would die. But if he went back and they ate the dogs, they would not be able to leave and they would die anyway. And now when he thought there was nothing from the ghost of Ugrek, no help, nothing, nothing from the trance of the time when they turned to yellow smoke. Whatever decision he made, when the light came back, it was his decision, just as going back to live the old way must have been his decision. And when the light came across the snow, he made the decision to go ahead and find game, knowing that if he was wrong, they would all be wrong. 
The woman, girl, the dogs, and all would be wrong and gone, gone and gone. In the second day he found nothing, nor did he on the third day, and now they had gone six days without eating, and he felt weak. His eyes worked poorly, and he ate snow so often that his lips were sore. Twice, then several more times, he thought he saw deer, but when he got to where they had been, there was nothing. Never had been anything. It was the hunger in his eyes, he found, that made him see things. Finally, the dogs stopped. They could pull no more, or so they thought. But now he remembered one more thing from Ugruk. The dogs run because they want to run, the old man told him, or because they think they want to run, or because you make them run. This is how to drive dogs. And so now Russell drove them. He cut a whip from some willows in the old stream bed, and he laid it on their backs, and they ran for him, but it was wrong. Wrong to drive them down that way. And he knew that when he had whipped them and made them run, and they were down, there would be nothing left. He would not get back to Nancy. His mind took that and made it part of him, and he was failing. He would not get back, as in the dream. He would not get back, and there would be only two bones left by the foxes. Two bones. And so he drove the dogs down, drove them the way the man in the dream had driven them. And when his mind was gone, when there was nothing left of his thinking and nothing left of the dogs, he came around a bend in the old stream bed and saw tracks. At first he didn't believe them. They came off the left side of the bank and tore down into the snow at the bottom. Breaking through the hard pack that had left had the, held the dogs and sled, he thought they were fro, they were from the hunger in his eyes. But when he got closer, they did not go away. They were huge, and when he got still closer, he saw that they were tracks of a great polar bear, and that he did not believe either because the bear was hunted out for what for their white fur. Men used snow machines and hunted them out, and there were no bears, but there were the tracks, and there were tracks of a great bear. And they had to be real because now the dogs caught the smell and took excitement. They increased speed, but he knew that they could not last now. And how to kill a bear, Ugrek said nothing. The arrow would not be enough. He had the killing lance and the sled, and he would have to use that somehow. He would have to catch the bear and use the lance to kill it. A polar bear that was bigger than he, the team, the sled, the woman, girl, and the tent combined. He had to take it with the small killing lance in the old way that nobody had used for so long that he didn't think there was a memory of it. Ugrik had never done it, or he would have told him. The dogs went faster still, and he was afraid that he would burn them out. He stopped them and let the right point dog loose, the one just in back of the leader on the right. He seemed to be the strongest dog and the most excited by the smell of the bear tracks. Perhaps he would catch the bear and keep it busy until Russell could get there and bring it down, or try. There was much doubt in him now about the bear, some fear and more doubt. But the dogs tore away up the stream bed, and Russell took the killing lance from the tie down in the sled and loosened the bow case and quiver. Then he kept the, let the dogs take the sled after the loose dog. They were clamoring to run, even though weakened by hunger. They smelled it now, saw him take up the weapons, and knew that he would try to kill soon, and the sight made them crazy. Up the old stream bed they wound following the tracks faster and faster until at last it came around a corner and there it was. The bear had his rear back against the bank, his head low and teeth bared. He was immense, the largest bear Russell had ever seen, even in pictures. The fur was dirty white, almost yellow. It was an old male with his teeth worn down, but full of the winter death that makes a polar bear so awesome. When he saw the sled coming, he raised on his hind legs and Russell's heart almost stopped. The bear was a tower, a white yellow tower standing over the loose dog. The dog had been dodging back and forth, trying to worry the bear, but when the bear raised, he went in to bite at the white back leg. It was his last act. The bear's head snaked down in a great curve of power, and his jaws closed on the back of the dog and broke its back in a bite so savage that the dog was dead before it could scream. Then the bear shook its head, a tearing shake, and the de dead dog flew sideways in a spray of gore, all in silence. And now the bear rumbled in its throat and turned to Russell and the sled and the team. Here was an enemy, a thing to face, and it would face it and kill it. And wait, Russell thought, but wait, bear. It is the same as the mammoth. There is sadness here for the same reason. A dog is dead. You will want the other dogs, and you will turn your head sideways, and the lance will enter you like light. But wait, bear, wait for me. Wait for the sadness of your life that you must die to feed the man. Not all the time. But wait for the sadness this time, Bear. Russell took the lance and stood away from the sled and let the dogs go. They went for the bear in a pummeling scream, and with the same sharp movement, the bear lowered on all fours and came for Russell. The bear did not want the dogs. He wanted Russell. 
He wanted to kill the enemy, standing with a little stick. Kill the man. Kill the man thing. Russell felt a great calmness. He wasn't Russell. He was the man in the dream. And the bear wasn't a bear, but the great stinking beast. And Russell set the shaft of the killing lance in the ground and held the wide ivory point at the right height to take the bear at the base of his throat. And now the bear came, and now the dog swerved in to take him. And the bear's head went sideways for the dog's. And the bear, stinking with the same smell as the beast in the dream, and now the bear had his head sideways, and now the lance entered. Like light, it slid through the hair and the fat and into the center of the bear, into the center of the center of the bear. And Russell screamed a savage roar of triumph, and the bear was on him, on him and over him, hitting him with a stunning blow of his right paw, even as the lance took his life. Russell knew he had killed the bear, but felt the pain and saw the flash as his own life seemed to fly from him, and he thought for a violent clarity, but wait, bear, but wait, bear, and then he saw nothing. And these things happened when Russell's life folded into the dream, and the dream folded into his life. When he came back into his life from where the bear had knocked him away, the bear was dead, and the dogs were chewing at his rear end. And Russell was underneath his left front shoulder, the blood dripping down on him from where the lance had shaft had entered the bear. He fought to get from under and crawl to the side. When he could stand, his head aching and dizzy, he looked down on the bear and felt his head, heart go out of him and into the bear. Thank you. The meat will be welcome. A sadness took him because he had no food for the bear. Such a bear it was, so big, but he had nothing for him but the thought of food. It would have to be enough. The bear was a mountain of meat. It weighed close to three quarters of a ton, 1,500 pounds. More meat than he could eat, than the dogs could eat in a month. More even than the woman girl. He remembered her suddenly. He would feed the dogs and take some meat and go back for her as fast as possible. He used his knife to lift the back end hide and took a large chunk of meat from the rear leg. This he fed to the dogs who ate and puked and ate again. Then he took another large chunk of fat meat, which he put in the sled, and he turned them and started back. They didn't want to leave the bear. The meat had given them strength almost miraculously fast, but they didn't want to leave the kill. He finally had to get in front of, and drag the leader back down the stream bed until they had gone around two bends and were well away from the dead bear. Even then they worked reluctantly for a time, but he let them seek their own pace and kept them going and in two days feeding them liberally from the meat as he drove them. They had come within sight of the tent. It was day, clear and cold, and he saw the lean to half a mile before they got to it. It was not tattered, but there was no steam coming from the opening at the top, and he feared for her. Nancy, he called her name when he came near the tent. I am back, but there was no answer. He set the hook and grabbed the meat and ran for the tent. It took him just a second to lift the corner and get inside, but he felt the cold immediately. She was lying on her side, the end of a skin wrapped around her as a sleeping bag, and she was either sleeping or dead or in a coma. The lamp was out, the fat was gone. He took some from the bear, rich yellow fat, and cut pieces into the lamp. He found some moss and got the lamp going, as for the first time, only with great difficulty. The warmth came out from the flame at once, and he opened the skin around the woman girl to let the heat reach her. When he moved her, he saw her eye flicker, and he thought twice. Twice she had come back from death. But this time she was not frozen as she had been the first time, or not frozen to such depth. There, there was not that wrong with her. She smiled at him. I did not think you were coming back. She spoke in a whisper that was almost a hiss. I said I would come back. She said nothing more. He cut meat in small pieces and heated them on the lamp and put them in her mouth. And she chewed and swallowed. And where there had been an end, there was once more a beginning. But worse was wrong. Worse than he thought could be. Even with the meat, she did not revive. She ate, and when she thought she could eat more, she held back and she did not come up. And because he had come to know the woman girl, he worried. You are sick, he said. Outside it was dark, and the wind was blowing again, or still. What makes you sick? She didn't answer at first. Then she grunted. It is the baby. The baby is coming early. I cannot stop it. Ugh! Oh, that is not good, is it? No, she turned away from him, face to the back of the tent. Maybe you should leave me alone. But he had run out once, left her to go for meat, and he would not leave her again. Leaving had torn him. And he still thought of the dream and the tattered tent with the foxes. I will stay. And then she said nothing to this and took that as acceptance, or perhaps she was too sick to argue. Is there a thing I can do, he asked. But again, she did not answer. He put more fat in the lamp, 
pulled the wick up to make more heat, then went outside and fed the dogs. They would sleep for days now, he knew, and that was fine. He had enough meat to last a long time. By then, they would be able to travel. If not, he could just go back to the carcass and get more. With a strong team, it was only a day and a half away. With food, anything was possible. When the dogs were fed and the meat pulled back in the shelter, he felt the exhaustion come down on him, and it was not possible for him to stay awake. In the warmth of the lean-to, he slept, the ringing, deep sleep of the utterly tired, when it seems as if nothing could awaken the mind. His head lay back against her feet, and he slept and thought he would not dream. But a thing came. He could not say if it was a dream or if it was real, but a thing came to happen in that night that he knew. And if he knew it sleeping or knew it awake, it did not matter. Foldings. The woman girl became a woman in the night. She was quiet at first, but moving and throwing her body back and forth, and then in the yellow of the lamp, she gave short, snap, sharp sounds, sounds from the center of her center, and he saw, felt that. She strained and heaved and pushed, and in the folds of the skin, and the agony of it was not something he understood, but he knew the sadness, because it was the same sadness, somehow, that killing the bear had been. In his mind, he tried to help her, but he was not sure if he really did or only wished that he could. And still she worked. The cries became closer together and shorter and deeper. And then she screamed. And then a time, a lifetime of almost animal whispers and another scream and a thing that happened. And it was in his hands and there was not life in it. Take it away, she screamed. Take it away now before I see it. Put it away from me. Outside. And either he did or dreamt he did or wished he did. He went from the tent with the baby and up on the hill in back of the tent, and he walked in the cold and put it on the hill, and he thought that he had never been so sad, a tearing sadness, but there was not life in it. There was not life. And when he got back to the lean-to, or thought he did, or wished he did, she was either asleep or unconscious, and he fell back on the skin and slept with her, and he wished then that he had stayed in his village. And these things happen when Russell's life folded into the dream, and the dream folded into his life. Nancy lay for five days in the lean-to, while Russell had fed her meat from the bear, warming small pieces on the end of a willow and hand, handing them to her. And there was some trouble he did not understand with a woman, and soon he, she went back to being a girl woman, looking small and pale, and when those five days had passed, he knew they would have to go. You need help, he said, from a doctor. We will have to go to a settlement. She said nothing. Her face had taken on the yellow of the lamp, but it was the wrong yellow, the kind of yellow that stayed even when he opened the tent flap and let the daylight in. Here it is the way it is, he told her, though he was not sure she knew what he meant or even that she listened. I do not know for sure where we are or how far we've come, but I think it is closer to the north coast in a village th there than it would be to try to get back to your village. We came a long way. My dogs are strong. Even now, he thought. Even now, it is hard to keep pride away. So I think we will go to the carcass of the bear and get meat and fat and then run for the north, as before. It should not be far to the edge of the land, and there will be a village as there. Our village is along the coast everywhere, and there will be help for you. It was the longest talk he had made since finding her. That is the way it is. Still, she said nothing, but she nodded, so he knew that even weak she understood and had been listening, and he felt better for that. So began the race. The dogs were strong, almost past measuring. Though there were only four left, they had been fed meat and run, so their legs rippled and were hard to the touch. Their heads were also hard. They had seen and done much, and now they knew the man on the sled, knew that he was a part of them, knew that no matter what happened, he would be there, and that made them stronger still. The strength in them came back to Russell, and he fed on it and returned it as more strength still. He, he, we have fire, he thought, as they left the camp and went for meat to begin the final leg of the run. We have fire between us that grows and grows, fire that will take us north to safety, fire that will save Nancy. So began the race. They took the meat from the bear, as much as Russell thought they could carry, but had to leave the hide, the beautiful hide, because it was too heavy. He took the skin from the front legs to make pants, but the rest had to stay. She brightened when they reached the dead bear. You did this, she whispered? With a spear you did this? He looked away. And with the dogs, a man does not kill a bear alone. The dogs helped. Still, it is a huge thing, is it not? And now he chose not to answer. The dead bear made him sad. Doubly so, because they had to leave it so much behind. 
It seemed wrong to talk of it as being a big thing, killing the bear with the lance. He did not wish to speak cheaply of it or brag of it. So began the race. They left the bear and headed north again, running in sun and light wind. In the dark and some gentle snow they ran. Up the edge of the saucer of light they ran. Day into day they ran for six days, stopping only to feed the dogs and rest them in three and four hour naps, sleeping on the sled or Russell sleeping next to it. And Nancy of the skins then up and gone away. I must win this race, Russell thought. I must win. The girl woman named Nancy got worse, grew weaker, but his strength grew with her in weakness. His strength grew and went into the dogs. Now they had more light. Winter was still there, but the sun was coming back and he ran through the sun, grateful for the warmth. Even the nights were not so cold. The dogs did not go down now. They were everything he would have wanted them to be, and he drove them with his mind, drove them to the edge of the land, drove them until he felt the land start to tip down, and then he smelled it. Finally, he saw the sea ice out ahead. When he got them to the edge of the sea, he stopped and leaned over. See, we are north. We have come to the edge of the land. She was still, but the edge of his eyes were, of her eyes were glowing with life, with happiness, with the pride in his voice at what his dogs had done. She was weak, weak and down. But there was still life, enough life, and the corners of his mouth turned up in a smile, a smile that went into Russell. See, he said, raising the team, we will be in a village soon. And he brought them up and ran them with his thoughts, and on the ice they cut a snow machine trail and followed it to the left because that is what his leader said to do, and he was the leader, and the leader was him. They drove down the coast, drowned to the edge of the sea ice and the land snow, drove into the swift light of the setting spring sun, drove for the coastal village that had to be soon. The man, boy, and the woman girl, and the driving mind dogs that came from Russell's thoughts, went out and out and came from the dreamfold back, back.